Bonjour tout le monde et merci pour euh, donner nous la chance à présenter. And now I'll speak in English. I'll try a few times to give you the words in French so I get it a little clearer what we're trying to say. Um, I apologize for the wrong. Um, we just came from a very large conference in California where there were 2,000 people on a mental health calif uh, conference. Um, how do I move the slides? Uh, you push on the green button. Oh. Uh, this one. The, the, the. Okay. This presentation is dedicated to Matthew Warren, who died by suicide on April 5th, 2013. He is the son of Rick and Kay Warren. Uh, Rick and Kay Warren um, uh, operate a church called the Saddleback Church. Um, Rick Warren wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life that has sold 30 million copies in the United States. And um, he, when I saw Rick in California, he told me that President Obama had called him and asked him to please come to Washington to welcome the Pope. So that sounds really wonderful, doesn't it? But Rick Warren's son was not diagnosed with borderline because he was told that your son can't have borderline because he's a boy, and he can't have borderline because you have such a happy family. So whatever problems you have, these very famous people have as well. So, I'm going to give you a presentation that is very different from everything you've heard this morning. Uh, everything that I say is based on neurobiology, and if you have questions, I will get you the studies that you can look at so you can find out for yourself. We at Tara call BPD a closet disorder because it only shows up with the people that you're closest to. If you go and tell your friend about what your loved one has done, they will generally look at you like, what are you talking about? So that we, as family members, you wind up feeling isolated, disbelieved, and invalidated. So when you describe BPD behaviors to others who haven't ever seen them, this is the usual expression that you get, the raised eyebrow. How do I bring it back? Did we lose all our animations? I don't know. Yeah, that's, well, okay. We lost our animation, so you have to uh, deal with me. How many of you think your loved one is irrational? Irrational. Let's see your hands. Fess up. How many of you think they're overreactive? Manipulative. What do you say? Manipulative. Abusive. Liars. We at Tara think of them as, um, you know, when you see children dress up in adults' clothes, they are like children in grown-ups' clothes. Does that sound familiar? Okay, so your loved one creates problems for the family, and you get all this behavior you don't understand. I just want to tell you before I go on that the aim of Tara is not to make you feel better, because you will only feel better when your kid or sister or brother or partner is better. So all our efforts are put into helping the person with borderline personality disorder. But in the meantime, you're getting behavior you don't understand. You're, how many of you are terrified when the phone rings, especially late at night? And you feel manipulated, and you feel helpless. Now we know that you guys, you men, like to feel like you're on this earth to protect and provide, and to, keep, to solve problems, to fix things. And when you get to a borderline person, that goes out the window because you can't fix it. So you usually have inappropriate and harmful reactions. You either try to protect them or rescue them, or some of you get to the point where you reject or avoid them. And you get very harmful advice, very often, sadly, from professionals. So what we at Tara say is you do the wrong thing for the right reason. And what is a typical family response? You're the worst mother in the world. And then you say, but I did this for you and I did that for you, and you're defending yourself. You personalize and you defend. Once you've done that, you're finished. And then you're either angry or anxious or you're avoiding. So what is it about BPD that makes it so difficult to deal with? And we consider it apparent confidence, a competence. 
So they're in extreme emotional pain, but they can act as if they're okay. And it's especially when they're acting with strangers. When they come home, you get the left-handed compliment and it all comes out. They are actors. And we at Tara feel that this is prevalent in very young children. But young children, how hard does it have to be to pretend to be three and act like the other three-year-olds? But when you get into 12, 13, 14, and you have all that peer pressure and sex and hormones, it gets harder and harder to just copy somebody else. Somebody told us, a person with borderline personality disorder, that when she was born, everybody got online and went to God to get a book on how to live in the world. And when it was her turn, God ran out. And so she spent her whole life looking over people's shoulders, trying to figure out how to act. Now, borderline, as has been said this morning, is the most stigmatized of all disorders. When I first started doing this, which was 21 years ago, when we brought Marsha Linehan to New York City for the first conference that she did, I couldn't understand stigma because how could you guys have stigma when you don't know what borderline personality disorder is? So this stigma is coming mostly from professionals. They consider borderline people the most difficult patient. I won't treat any borderlines in my practice. I'll only allow one. They never get better. They manipulate. They've all been abused. They just want attention. They're faking their pain. They split the staff. They can't be diagnosed, and especially in adolescents. And that is, we've been doing surveys at Tara, is the general attitude of most professionals. And the person with borderline personality disorder. We have been keeping data on calls for 21 years. So I have a library of books in the office with data on every caller. And we've run a survey on misdiagnosis and mistreatment, and we've gotten over 2,000 responses. Most people with borderline are not formally diagnosed. When they come to our class, the families come in, they diagnose them themselves. And guess what? I trust the families. But what are they diagnosed with? Well, when they enter the system, it's usually with ADD. Then they graduate to depression and anxiety. Some of them get bipolar. They get uh, intermittent explosive oppositional defiant PTSD. And in case anybody is interested, uh, the NIMH was suddenly realizing that maybe there were kids who had this kind of a disorder invented a new disorder called temper dysregulation disorder. And we have begged the person who developed this to say it could be BPD, try DBT, and they, review, they have refused. But I think you can find this in very young children. Most people with BPD have been to many, many, many therapists where they have had negative experience and they failed. Where does that leave them? They feel hopeless. So when you say, gee, I just found this new treatment, it's DBT, you have to go, they say, I'm not going. So for us at Tara, when families come to us for training, the hardest job we have is how do you get the person with BPD to go into evidence-based treatment? Um, this is, oh my goodness, this is how people with borderline feel. Misunderstood, invisible, ashamed, disconnected, isolated, unheard, dismissed. Now, how do I know that this is how they feel? Well, our helpline got so many calls from all over the country for a support group for borderlines. So I decided about two years ago that I would dive in, and we have been running a BPD group for two years in which we tried to do psychoeducation and give them facts. And from working with people with BPD themselves, we have come to see just how isolated and alone and misunderstood they feel. So when we describe borderline personality disorder, picture a juggler juggling balls. Every ball in the air, you know a juggler can go like this or he can go up and down like that. Each ball represents a different part of the brain that's in dysregulation. So it will be a little bit like what Dr. Hoffman showed you before, but we include more areas. Impulsivity. Their memory dysregulated. Have they ever told you that they don't remember anything happy from their childhood? Isn't that tragic? 
unstable moods. How many of them have sleep disorder? They don't sleep right. Some of them don't sleep right from early childhood. Sensitivity. How many of them have extremely high sensitivity? Hypervigilance, pain. So what we do, we call this the Tara Tiara. The most important thing you can do for somebody with BPD is have compassion. Compassion, meaning from your heart, feeling for them and wanting to help. So how do you remind yourself to have compassion when they're calling you names and telling you you're the, you're the worst person in the world? So this is what we do. And picture yourself wearing this, and when you come to our class, everybody gets one, and each one of these stands for a system in dysregulation. So the current, as of 2012, Christian Schmalb looked at borderline personality disorder this way, as emotion dysregulation, identity disturbance, and social interaction problems. There's a brilliant doctor who will be here at this conference named Sabine Herperts, and she just published an article in September's Journal of the American Psychiatric Association, and she talks about cognition as part of what is wrong, what creates borderline personality disorder. We don't go with the DSM. It's it doesn't seem relevant to us. So here's how we describe borderline personality disorder. And if this works for you, I hope, I hope it will. In French, the word is menace, but it's hypervigilant. People with borderline personality disorder have a highly tuned system where they're like a periscope, like a radar screen, going around like this constantly looking for danger looking for danger. So we call it a high threat protection system. And if you want to learn more about this, you should read Paul Gilbert's work on compassion-focused therapy. So why would people with BPD have this high threat system and be so super sensitive? What would be the genetic advantage of having a superior sense of sight, smell, uh, touch, danger, taste, what do you think, why would you think that would be inherited generation after generation? Well, if you happen to be living in a cave, who would you like to live with? A person with BPD, because they could smell if the food was bad, they could see the facial expression and know the neighbor was gonna do something, they would hear the animals rustling outside. So their super sensitivity was very good in other times. My belief is that our present world is just so, so stressful for them that they, they just, they can't tune anything out, which is probably why they get ADHD um, diagnoses. Does this make sense to you? The super sensitivity. How many of you have found that as young children, they were super sensitive? Particularly, I think, to sound, to sound. How many of you have them who are musical? There are many, many people with BPD are musical. So they're super sensitive. They feel as if they have no skin. And when they have a higher baseline for their responses than anybody else. So when you look at this chart, I have a, a pointer to look at. They go to the highest peak, and I think that was shown here before, the highest peak of emotional reaction, and they stay up longer, and they go down slower except if the phone rings and somebody says there's a party and then they get up and they go. Have you had that experience? So where does all of this come from? Well, we start out with the system of fight or flight. You know what that system is. It's a very primitive, old system in the brain, and it's where we have something called the amygdala. If you put your hand in the back of your neck, just where your spine goes into your head, and sort of shove a pencil right up there, you'll get right to your amygdala. Your amygdala is a part of the brain that gets the valence, the sense of threat in a place. That's where that is processed. But that's not the whole story. The amygdala also stores emotional memories permanently. In the hippocampus, which is, I don't have a pointer, which is the kind of the curve thing, the hippocampus stores like telephone numbers, how did you get here, what did you learn in school, who your husband is, what your wife's name is, that all's in the uh, hippocampus. But the amygdala is the home of emotion. 
And what do you think the amygdala of borderlines is like? Do you think it's normal, lower reaction, higher reaction? What do you think? It's through the sky, higher reaction. And by the way, it's even smaller. Borderline is one of the very few mental disorders where mood changes based on triggers. And triggers are daily life interpersonal issues. So the idea that we could send them to therapy for three hours a week or one hour a week and the problem would be solved, to me, is kind of doesn't make sense because at three o'clock in the morning when something happens and they walk into the kitchen and they're upset, that's an interpersonal issue and they're, they're going and what are you gonna do about it? Call the therapist? You have to know what to do because you can stop so many escalations by knowing what to do. So the first order of triggers is interpersonal issues, not major life events. Also, their mood change are very quick, quick, and I think Dr. Hoffman explained that in bipolar, you have to be manic or depressed for a long period of time. What's the first question they ask in a doctor's office? How long have you been depressed? Two weeks, three weeks? Well, have you ever sat with a borderline and in one hour you can see five mood changes? Okay, so you're not imagining any of this. So this is cortisol, that's your stress hormone. So if you look at the bottom line, that's a normal person hearing a script of something unpleasant and recovering, notice the red line is pretty straight. The second line, the blue line, is PTSD. So you see they start out at a higher level of cortisol, they're more stressed. And then they go up and they come down. But look at our borderlines. They start out the highest, they go up the highest, and then they don't even recover, they, keep, they stay escalated up there. So what you're dealing with, with somebody with BPD, is a powder keg with this very high searching for, for danger. Constantly searching for danger. Okay, and they have their emotional uncomfortableness is experienced very often as pain. So one of our people described it as waking up in the morning, picking up this big rock next to the bed, going down for breakfast, going to work, holding this great big rock, which is a rock of pain, carrying it everywhere you go, finally coming home at night, putting the rock down, knowing you have to pick it up in the morning, and guess what? It's invisible to everybody else. So please understand that they're always, always feeling aversive feelings and in pain. So here is... Um, a little study that was done on aversive feelings. Now let's think, what does aversive mean? Aversive is like a spider crawls across the table. You see rats running across the room. Things that give you like, ugh, horrible feelings. Those are aversive feelings. The normal control is the blue, and you notice they start very low and only go up to about three or four. But look at where the person with BPD starts. They start about five and they go all the way up. I'm trying to tell you that these people feel uncomfortable, miserable most of the time. Now, we also know, and you should go and hear Dr. Herbert speak when she's here, is that they have difficulty trusting anybody. Have you noticed that they don't trust you? Have you noticed that they don't trust anyone? But that's cause of something called oxytocin. So what, um, what do we know about oxytocin? Well, the man who was running the National Institute of Mental Health in America um, first brought our attention to oxytocin with a study on what we call prairie voles. I've never seen a prairie vole, but I gather they're like little field mice out in the Midwest of America. So prairie voles have a very special quality. They marry for life. They pair bond. Once they bond, they stay with that other mouse the other prairie vole forever. So Dr. Insel studied prairie voles and he found out that they had high oxytocin. So of course, in, with all their magic methods, they removed the gene for the oxytocin. And guess what happened to the prairie voles? They started philandering and that was the end of fidelity. So then they found another species of prairie voles and they put that oxytocin gene in and all of a sudden they were pair bonded. Oxytocin is the hormone that comes out when you give birth and milk starts to flow. That's the hormone. It makes you bond to these people. 
And gentlemen, you have oxytocin too and vasopressin. Uh, Sabine Herperts and others in Germany are doing a lot of research, as are some people at Mount Sinai in New York. We know that there's something wrong with the oxytocin level in people with BPD. They're searching for a way to turn it into some kind of a drug. But somehow or other, when they give up oxytocin, what happens is they, they become less trusting. So somewhere in the level of trust, there is a problem with BPD. So now the problem that happens is after you get this big blast of emotion and, and threat, you have to decide, well, is it a snake or is it a stick? Are they out to kill me or are they just walking down the street? So when we look at perception, perception varies with people. So it's Thanksgiving yesterday. So the husband says, oh, the chicken was perfect, it's, but it was missing salt. And the wife says, oh, no, it was too salty. And the son says, oh, but it was perfect. It was wonderful, mom. And the daughter says, oh, no, it was too fatty. Who's right? Is anybody right? Or is it just the way we each perceive things differently? Um, people with BPD are sleep dysregulated. How many of you had children who didn't sleep normally when they were infants? How about difficulty in sleeping as they grew up? So the, I don't know, I think Martin Boas did one study with BPD on sleep, and I think he put them in a lab, and they slept, and when they woke up, he said, well, how was your sleep? And they said, I didn't sleep. But they were in the lab, and they were sleeping. So we know we need research on sleep. Another thing that we know for quite a long while is that people with borderline misinterpret faces. So how many of you have been told when the borderline person goes up and is escalating, stay neutral? Have you been told to stay neutral? Don't react? Well, guess what? When a person with BPD sees a neutral face, they perceive it as angry and usually as angry at them. So the worst thing you can do is be neutral. You have to match their emotion, match their voice tone, match their body language, show them with physicality that you're hearing them. So it isn't just validating them with your voice, with a sentence, it's with your whole being. So no neutral faces. So we wonder, is BPD a language disorder? Is it emotional dyslexia? What we find as the common denominator of anybody who comes to us is that people with BPD misinterpret what you say. And they misinterpret it in the direction of criticism, judgment, blame, rejection. Is that your experience? Whatever you say, they, get, they have negative bias. And the research shows they go through the anterior cingulate in the brain and they're negatively biased they're rejection sensitive. When they walk in a room, they look at faces to see who's rejecting them. That's a pretty sad way to live. So anything, any word you say, they're like the princess and the pea, but anything you say can be, lead them towards dysregulation. In my book, I have a section about past the butter. You're sitting at the dinner table, and it's Thanksgiving, and you say to someone, pass the butter. Is there anything more stupid, benign than pass the butter? And the person says what? I bet you could all tell me what the person says. What's the matter? You can't get it yourself. You don't want me to eat. You think I'm too fat. I'm not your servant. It sound familiar? And you sit there like you've you know, been shell-shocked. Like, where did that come from? Because they interpret things as always about them, always negative, always towards rejection. It's a very sad way to go through life. So think about them as if somebody who's colorblind, only you get to the traffic light, you want to stop for red, they tell you to keep going. And what you don't know is that this person is colorblind and they don't know that they're colorblind. So you're having this huge argument, but actually somebody's colorblind. Uh, people with borderline personality disorder suffer from shame. And my colleague, Dan Gordon, is going to tell you about it, but it is a part of BPD that nobody talks about. But they constantly will tell you, and that's what I hear in my BPD group, they hate themselves, they think they're bad, they think they don't deserve anything nice. Have you heard any of this from them? I'm a failure, I'm a loser, I'm no good. And they keep that inside. 
And as far as I know, the only treatment that slightly affects that is transference-focused therapy, and Barry Stern will be talking about that on Thursday. So here you can see um, the normal person is on the right, the healthy control, and on the bottom line, you have shame, and the top line, you have anxiety. But with the person with BPD, the anxiety is the lower line, and shame is the higher. We've just done a survey on shame. We've got about 400 responses, and they write out what they feel about themselves. And I tell you, when I read it, I just sit and I cry, because it's heartbreaking to think about how much they hate themselves. Now, here's the most important slide I can ever show you. It's from Antonia New. Let's raise those hands again. Lie? Do they lie? Do they manipulate? Okay. Let's look at the brain. I need a pointer. If you look at the bottom, you're sitting at the beach. Two of you are sitting at the beach looking out at the ocean. See those nice chairs? You're, looking at the beach, you're at the beach looking at the water. You're thinking about, oh, what a wonderful thing to be away from my work and how beautiful the waves are. And the person with BPD is thinking, I wonder if there are sharks in there. Hmm, if I go down to the water, I'll bet I'll have to step on jellyfish. Hmm, the sand is so hot. So you're getting two different perceptions of reality simultaneously. So on the left, if you look at the lower part of the brain, you see a yellow part with just a little bit of red. That's where your visual cortex is. So the normal person is just kind of relaxed. But look at the borderline person. There's a lot of red in that visual part. No pointer? <laughs> okay, so you see where that's red down where the second yellow arrow is. Because they're scanning the environment looking for the whales and the jellyfish and the tigers and the sharks. So if you look up at the top of the brain where it says control subjects, this is the prefrontal cortex. This is where you control impulses, where you have executive function. But you're on the beach and you're on vacation, so there's hardly any activity up here. If you look to the right and you see the person with BPD, there's a lot of activity. Why? Because they're scanning for danger and figuring out what to do. So now, here comes danger. Somebody comes in with a gun. Okay? So what happens to the normal person? Fight or flight goes in. So look at the bottom where you see how red it got. That's the visual part. You look at the top part, and you can see a lot of yellow because you're figuring out what to do. You're going to take an action. And then you look at the person with BPD's brain. Where the visual part goes, it's diffused. And where the thinking, executive functioning control part comes, it's less. So the person with borderline personality disorder, when they are stressed, when they are what you're all calling dysregulated, at that moment, they have less control of the ability to make a decision, ever go shopping with them, less control of action, and that's why the impulsive behavior goes on. To manipulate, you need control of your prefrontal cortex. To lie, you need control of your prefrontal cortex, and the people with BPD don't have it. Also, at those times, they get self-referential, meaning you disappear, and all they're thinking about is themselves. Does everybody understand this? I'll take questions later on. I'm, I'll be outside. So what, in essence, we're saying is the amygdala is the gas pedal, prefrontal cortex is the brake, and serotonin is brake fluid. So here's my favorite slide, which unfortunately doesn't work with animation. Your trigger goes into the amygdala, which is that little yellow thing. And then you go up to an area called the cingulate, where you have to interpret what just happened. And you can guarantee that your person with BPD is going to interpret to the negative, they're negatively biased, they're self-referential, they're rejection sensitive, and the saddest thing of all is they don't deal with positive emotions very well. So now that you've got all of this misinterpretation, you go up to the prefrontal cortex, which is that little pink part. This all moves, I'm so sorry. 
and you are now overwhelmed and you can't act on it. And that's what's going on every day. So throw in a little shame. So what we want to teach you is how to speak limbic language. And Alan Frazetti is a master on teaching validation, so you will benefit from hearing him teach you how to do that. But when you are validating, you are speaking to the amygdala. When you speak to a person with BPD and say, you shouldn't be doing that because it's dangerous, we were waiting for you, we needed to do that, it was too expensive, nothing goes in because that's logic. You do not use logic. You use emotional language. Otherwise, they don't hear you. So what do we hope for? Eric Kandel won the Nobel Prize for a concept called neurogenesis. And he said, the brain can change. It develops new neuronal circuitry. Through learning, the brain can change. Dyslexics can learn to read. I was just in this conference in LA, and I flew in at night. And I'm a New Yorker, but LA is unbelievable to me with the traffic. And I looked at all those highways. Have you ever been to LA and looked at those highways? Just picture those highways if they get blocked, if there's an accident, and everybody's got to take a different path. That's what happens to borderline brains. Their brains have different paths than everyone else. And with neurogenesis, they can grow new circuits. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is called hope. So thank you. My name is Dan Gordon. I'm a, a volunteer with Tara. I've learned a lot from Valerie. Um, the part of the presentation that I'm going to do is... You push the, yeah. this one. Yeah. No, I just want to go backwards. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to look at how shame fits into the life of a, a person with borderline personality disorder. Uh, we'll look specifically at the difference between guilt and shame. We'll uh, also look at the responses of people with borderline personality to shame and increase your understanding of the signs of shame as they uh, uh, the signs of shame that are exhibited by your, the person with borderline personality disorder. I just want to say that I'm a substitute teacher here, <laughs> and as such, the slides may not fit exactly what I'm saying. So while you may be confused by some of the slides, just imagine and use your compassion for me <laughs> as I uh, try and juggle a few of these uh, things that are happening in my brain. So the, uh, the Tara method, as developed by family, uh, Valerie, uh, empowers family members to become therapeutic partners uh, to the person with BPD through evidence-based education program. It's been developed over several years. Valerie had said that she's been involved for 21 years so that you can become an effective ally to your loved one. It, just to emphasize, it is not a support group. Whoa. Uh, Valerie outside has a book uh, that uh, has all these experiences and training in, the, in, in it. So you can take a look out there if you want more information about anything. I just want to acknowledge Valerie here. She's worked tenaciously to educate families and people with BPD, and she's a fierce advocate for uh, BPD research. And we wouldn't be where we are today without Valerie's presence. So thank you. Thank you. The foundation of Tara method is to develop pa uh, compassion for your loved one because no one asks to have BPD. The outcome of becoming an effective therapeutic partner is what is listed here. 
So let's get started on what shame is about. Uh, how would you feel in this situation? Uh, despite being asked, you, uh, you don't help out in the kitchen very often, but this time you did. You dropped and broke a dish with the pasta and tomato sauce in it. The food went all over the kitchen floor, it made a complete mess, and the sauce stained the tiles. How would you feel? So just hold that thought. Um, did anyone feel guilt? Raise your hand. Did anybody feel shame? Okay. Do we really understand the difference between guilt and shame? Uh, these are negative conscious emotions. Guilt is about the behavior, and while shame is a negative feeling that impacts the whole self. To il illustrate, let's go through a couple of examples. You've agreed to meet your daughter to go to the movies. You get so tied up in work that you miss the, uh, the time of the movie. Your, your daughter is really quite upset at you for having missed this. What can, what can you do in that situation? As a guilt, you would feel guilty because you've missed the time there. But you're starting to think about how to problem solve. You would consider going for dinner and catching the next movie time. You're concerned about how your daughter is feeling. Would you agree to go tomorrow? But you're looking to problem solve all the time. Let's take another example that would illustrate, illustrate shame. You and your brother are playing ball and the ball goes through the window. Immediately, your mom comes out and starts yelling at your brother for having broken the window. You stand there silently, not, not participating in this. How do you feel there? How, how does your brother conceive you? Are they conceiving you as a coward for not, not being part of taking the blame here. That affects the whole person. And that's where uh, shame and guilt differentiate. Here is another uh, way to appreciate the difference. You can look at some of the adjectives that are associated with guilt and some of them that are associated with shame. However, it's critical to differentiate guilt is about behavior whereas shame is about the whole self. Understanding this difference can change your attitude towards your, your loved one, as well as treatment by professionals can change. So coming back to people with BPD, shame is the common denominator of most BPD responses to situations and experiences. It's highly negative and very painful emotion, resulting in the person believing they are flawed, unworthy of connection or belonging. To give more weight and understanding to the meaning of shame in people with BPD, these are some quotes from an online survey that Valerie had mentioned that Tara has done. This also was going to be animated, but. I'm not going to read them out. Read these to yourself. And just look back my way when you've finished this page. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to read a couple of these ones. Even when I have a happy feeling, the backlash is shame. I shouldn't be happy like that or express it. I shouldn't be sad either, because that's selfish. I just can't win. Being fundamentally flawed in a way I can't seem to fix, no matter what I do. Hopelessly pathetic, I want to crawl into a hole and never leave it. I bring negativity into the environment of those around me and treat people who are so patient and loving anyway horrifically. I don't even know how to apologize properly anymore. It's like I'm in endless debt to everyone. 
So let's go back to that scenario where you helped in the kitchen, you dropped the pasta, you stained the tile. How does your loved one feel in this situation? First of all, I'm a bad person for breaking the dish. I'm worthless, I've ruined the dinner again. I can't do anything right. I don't deserve to live here. They think I'm a loser. I am a loser. Is that profound? Those feelings, if you can live um, and appreciate the emotions that your, per, the person with bo uh, borderline is going through, you're on a long way towards helping them. Shame and guilt uh, are two emotions that until the age of eight, they go together. It's after age eight when children start to differentiate between guilt and shame. A, board, a person with borderline personality disorder never differentiates. How am I doing on time? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, let's now discuss some of the ways people with borderline personality disorder uh, cope with shame. There's a person called Donald Nathanson who's put together this, this, uh, uh, this diagram here. And these are four ways that uh, uh, your, one of your loved ones may uh, cope. You may recognize that they could withdraw or they could avoid the situation. They could attack others or they could attack themselves. A maladaptive way of coping with shame is to withdraw. It can be infuriating to you when your loved one leaves the family dinner, but understand from his or her point of view that it is an intolerable or unsafe situation. Doing this because they are overwhelmed or maybe because the intensity of his or her shame is, they need, is the reason they need to withdraw. You can help by creating an accepting family culture. Another of the maladaptive ways that people with BPD cope is to avoid situations that cause intense shame. It's crucial to them to minimize the potential occurrence of shame. Sorry. Oh, right. It's crucial to them to minimize the potential occurrence of shame. So when you're trying to engage your loved one in a conversation, recognize when they say, I don't want to talk about it, or don't show up, and you are frustrated out of your mind, that they are coping with shame in the best way they can. As the as a family member of a person with BPD, one of the most disturbing and scary ways uh, that he or she copes with shame is self-attacking behavior. The ways of coping can run the gamut from self-deprecating and put-downs to substance abuse, cutting, and even suicide attempts to escape extremely painful and chronic feelings. The final maladaptive way of coping in Nathanson's schema is attacking others. It is important to understand when feelings of extreme shame are provoked, your loved one will feel no empathy to others. Back to the self-referential that Valerie was talking about. Again, the responses can run the gamut of put downs and ridicule of others to violence and attacking people. From your loved one's point of view, he, she wants to diminish the other person who caused the shame. It is relevant and important to accept that most conversations and experiences will provoke feelings of shame. And you, as the family member, can learn and practice techniques that may reduce shame triggers and their reactions. Lisa with the techniques and skills, we'll go into that some more. So, um, your loved one, with also with your help, needs ways to save uh, 
uh, save face. So looking at it more from your loved one's point of view, a person with BPD is prone to shame. So only one of the, the things can be a, on this list. Sorry, I'm not there. Can be a, any one of these things can be a shame trigger. Most of us would accept them as just parts of our life, but we can become more compassionate by seeing his or her point of view. For instance, taking a living situation. If, you're, if your loved one is living with you in their, in their 30s, then that may be viewed as a deficiency on their part. If they are, you are paying their rent, no matter where they're living, that could be viewed as a deficiency. Here are some specific, oops, sorry. Here are some specific situations for shame triggers. Stigma, as was talked about this morning and Valerie spoke about too, could come from the bottom left two, uh, three uh, situations, uh, going to the emergency room, residential treatment, or treatment failure. There's a lot of stigma there that is, provokes uh, shame. Also, looking at it from your loved one's point of view, you may be appalled if you think your loved one is lying, but listen to what they're really saying. They could be using BS because a, uh, they've been triggered and all they want to do is get out of that situation. It's not that they have any intention of lying to you, but it could be viewed that way. It's when you do recognize the trigger, you validate and mentalize, as uh, uh, Lisa will show. So here's an example of BS and the responses. I didn't do it. So here are the take home messages from this part of the presentation. Shame is an extremely painful and pervasive feeling that has a negative impact on interpersonal behavior, especially with those closest to the person, i.e. the people in this room, most likely. People with BPD are shame prone. Shame flourishes when secrecy, silence, and judgment exist, hence, for us to have the skills so that we can keep communication going with our loved ones. It's critical to distinguish between shame, which is about self, versus guilt, which is about specific behaviors. Developing compassion will help you become a therapeutic partner and an ineffective one too. And remember, no one asks to have BPD. Thank you for your attention here. I'll pass it along to Lynn, Lisa now. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm up already. Okay. So, uh, hi, I'm Lisa Rosenberg. I have been a co-facilitator of Tara Groups for about five years now. I was brought there by a most untenable living situation with my two teenage daughters, both of whom have borderline personality disorder. They're now 22 and almost 24. And I'm still in relation to them, so. I attribute that to what I learned at Tara, because it looked pretty iffy for a while. So uh, at Tara, we work with families and loved ones, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, siblings. Uh, and when they come to Tara, they're usually pretty desperate at their wit's end. Um, so we talk about the really the most important thing is to stay in relation to this person who's in so much pain. You've had a little portrait of what's going on in the neurology and, and in a primary emotion. And they're very hard to be in relation with. So we 
we um, teach our participants to really be therapeutic allies. The groups are really for the person with borderline rather than for the people who are sitting in the room. And we sometimes get a lot of emotional lability because people want us to support them, but we're really the ones who have to change in order to stay in relation. So um, we have this five-pronged approach to uh, staying in relation. Oh, I'm gonna, this, which one is back? back? I'm sorry, back, back is back. So compassion, humility, intuition, restraint, and persistence. Why is it going twice? Okay, so compassion, um, you bring, in order to bring down anger, when I came to Tara, I was a very angry, red-faced woman. What about me? Don't I have rights? <laughs> and uh, it took Valerie a long time to open me up to get my anger down and get my compassion up. But here's, you know, one technique we, we teach. Just, you know, they're sick people. They have an illness. And we would renovate our house if a child came home having lost a leg or needing some physical adaptation. We wouldn't think for a minute about not making a physical adaptation to our homes. And our loved ones with BPD also need us to make adaptations. One of the ways to bring up compassion is to bring up your humility. This is in Valerie's book, this acceptance acknowledgement declaration. I never knew how much pain you were in. I never knew how much you suffered. I must have said and done so many things to hurt you because I did not understand or acknowledge your pain. I am so sorry. It was never my intention to cause you pain. What can we do now to improve our relationship? Now, I didn't use this until I was eight weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks into working with the Tara course because you can't, you ha it has to be genuine. Your humility, you have to really have seen what's going on and recognize the pain and understand that you have contributed to it. I had contributed to the pain my children were in and to the distress our relationships were in. So um, intention is important because it pro provides a little bit of safe space for them to feel what we're talking about. It was not our intention. When I finally used this with my daughter, it was the first time I think we had really communicated in three or four years that there was not just two talking heads at each other, but a moment of communication. Um, and they're often very suspicious at first. Don't use that psychobabble on me. Because you're changing. We as the therapeutic ally, as the loved one, is changing and they don't know where we're coming from and it's a little, they get a little suspicious. Um, so, a lot of this is based on our intuition in the moment, in the situation, what's going on. I'm going to talk a little bit about what kind of facts we can use to go into to build our intuition on, but you make mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. So you go back. You go back to humility. You go back to thinking about what I've done, how I can communicate more effectively. Only those who do, no, who do nothing make no mistakes. Uh, Valerie referred to this a little bit earlier with, uh, with we, we find a lot of times the men in, our, in the classes really want to be protectors. Who doesn't? But it's very hard. You can't really jump into the water and swim in the pool with them. You can't save them. I've had to work really hard on developing my own distress tolerance. It's a DBT skill. If our loved ones are in DBT, they're learning distress tolerance. I also had to learn distress tolerance because it's hard. When you know they're walking off the end of a, of a pier or on a tightrope, how do you just let them go? So I had to do a lot of work with myself to live with my anxiety and live with my distress and allow them with some work with me to make their own choices. Persistence is the fifth prong. Uh, they will do everything to get us off track. 
sidetracked and derailed. They'll bring up things from 20 years ago. You're the worst mother in the world. You didn't call him my boyfriend when I was four years old, and he was my boyfriend, and you said he's just a friend. <laughs> I mean, it was like, she was 15 then. I was like, I never heard that before. So you have to be trained on a track, very persistent. Well, that was then and this is now. We can talk about that another time, but right now we're talking about this. Uh, so one of the ways that we give ourselves three or four seconds to uh, begin to think about things is we use the word wow. Wow! and then we go into a validation. So in the wow, we have three seconds, five seconds to wait to observe and to apply a skill that we've learned to wing it. If we make a mistake, we can always go back. I've made a lot of mistakes, but we're still in relation. Um, so, mm, I'm in a different order here. I'm gonna move forward a minute. This doesn't have grieving. That's right. Okay, good. so I'm just going to talk about it for a minute. Uh, the, t the slides are not here, but one of the things that we do in our classes is a grieving ritual. We have found it's very important. We are all grieving. We're not. We didn't. Um, we didn't have a particular death, but we had the death of a relationship. We had the death of the dreams that we had. Uh, we had. We're in a different place than we expect it to be as parents and as loved ones. And, you know, people come in and we see a lot of anger. When we scrape away at the anger and at the confusion and at the despair the loved ones are feeling, underneath we find grief. So Tara has developed a grieving ritual that we do together. And uh, it, it's described in the book, Valerie, is it not? Yeah. You can take a look at the book and see it, but we just found it was very important to acknowledge that grief in a supportive community. So we have done that. Uh, so these are some. These are the list of skills that we use. Um, we'll talk about various things: validation, acceptance, interpersonal skills, tolerating distress. I already mentioned. I just want to. Um, bring up that we see validation as only half of the sentence. The other half of the sentence is providing a change strategy. So once you ha and we find that parents very often don't speak emotional language. So it's I took me a long time to learn to recognize and respond to emotions and not be logical. But once I have been able to do that, then. I can provide a change strategy. If I hit them with the change strategy first, forget it. The escalation may hit high, ceilings higher than I have. Um, so taking the emotional temperature, um, in order to do that, you have to pay attention to certain things. Um, one of them is voice tones. We do a workshop with voice tones. I used to, when my kids would start to escalate, I used to get very calm and try to like just diffuse the situation. And all I did was make it worse because we've done some work and we see matching voice tones is very important. So if they're up here, I have to come in and go, wow, it looks like you're really upset about that. What happened? And I can start to bring it down. But if I don't match the voice tone first, I'm out of the water. Same with body language. They are really astute. They read us like the, the Bible or the Koran. They have studied us. They see every microfacial expression that goes across our face. They interpret it, often misinterpret it, almost always negatively. But if you have shown some little flicker, they're going to see it and they're going to read it and you have to be aware, and say, oh, I did have that emotion. Wow, I can see you saw that on my face at the same time, and try to bring it back to train on track. Uh, Valerie brought up in the um, neurobiology that they don't have a lot of memory for positive events. 
Uh, some of the things we do, we ask parents to make little photo albums showing happy events. It's very important. We know them better than anybody else. A therapist doesn't know what they did when they were 4, 8, 12. We know. We have their memories. So one of the things we talk about is helping them to remember the things that they've done, their past, the past difficulties they have overcome, earlier breakups, how they survived things, the happy times that they had, and a DBT skill, a feeling is not a fact. We also talk about writing emails to repair relationships. Sometimes it's just because it's helpful to practice the language. I often don't send my emails, but I often will write something because it gives me a chance to really think out my thoughts, figure out what the right words are, how to approach the situation and not exacerbate it. Uh, we talk about fragilizing. We referred to this earlier. We don't want to turn them in. We don't want them to think we think they're fragile. We want to build mastery. So Marsha Linehan talks about irreverence a lot in her work with DBT. That a situation, wow, you know, you, I remember when you wore spiked high heels and you were walking all around, or something a little bit less serious and a little irreverent about what they're feeling can sometimes dispel the intense emotion. Um, you know, we, we do not want to fragilize them. We want to build mastery to give them the opportunity to do things well and to remind them always because we know you can do hard things. When I say this to my daughter, she lights up. She's like, wow, thanks, mom. She doesn't know that she can do hard things. And their focus is on what they can't do. They're always in a negative bias. You can do hard things. Wow, you really believe that? Wow. <laughs> Um, we keep an elephant in the, in the Tara office. I cannot tell you I'm the big elephant taking out person. How many times I have to take out that elephant because when you're dealing with your loved one, if you haven't acknowledged things, there is a big elephant in the room. It might be blue or pink or purple polka dots. It is there. And if you ignore it, you're ignoring them and they know it. So you got to kind of bite that bullet and begin to have the real conversation. We're their cheerleader. We have to believe in them. We do believe. I mean, they're our loved ones, whether they're our children. You know, I talk from the mother's perspective. I know my kids' strengths. They're terrific kids. They have a lot of abilities that they can't bring to the surface very often. So we validate their inherent ability to overcome their difficulties and obstacles. We remind them of past accomplishments. We're a coach. Uh, we have one of the techniques we use to help them think about things because I don't know about your loved ones, but my loved ones have this place or this place and they don't see anything in the middle. Everything is either the worst thing that could happen or the best thing that could happen. So we use a scale and we say, well, was it as bad as the time you lost your job? Was it as bad as when you had the breakup with your boyfriend? Was it as, thank you. Was it as bad as the time you fell into the water and ruined that silk shirt? And normally with, with you know, with a lot of people, you wouldn't need to do this so specifically and bring out things to say, was it that bad? But they don't have the range to build a scale of how bad things are. It is the worst in this moment right now. It is the worst thing that ever happened. So this is another technique that we use. Oh, here we go. I got this animation. <laughs> and we help them to rate. The word proud, the word proud is a very, there's two very important concepts on here. First, when we say I'm proud of you, it really steals from them. It's a judgment. 
I'm proud of you. I'm the queen, and I am proud of you. And even though that's not what we mean, that's what is often heard. So I've really changed my language, and I've changed it not only with my children with borderline, but in every person that I deal with, with children, I'll say, wow, you must be really proud of yourself. Wow, that was really quite an accomplishment. I guess you feel proud of yourself. And the difference is immense. It gives them the ownership of the pride. We is even worse. We fight, we and Tara fight with parents all the time who say, well, we did this with our child, and we feel this way. And Valerie can get into it <laughs> deeply because people don't want to give up their we. But it's hard enough to be borderline in relation with one person and have to deal with this person who's out in the world, has a job, has a relationship, has friends, and here's this borderline person sitting in their room alone in relation only to their computer. And so being, having a conversation with I is hard enough. Having a conversation with a we, you're just setting it up for failure. So we work really hard to get parents to separate into their own relationship. Each parent has to develop their own relationship. There is no we. Uh, so what to avoid when validating? Uh, borderlines are allergic highly allergic to criticism, judgment, and blame. You did this. You. You. you, you, you you're out of the park. You're, you're not having that conversation anymore. Um, if you make mistakes when you're trying to validate, you can always go back. You go back to humility. You go back to an earlier step. You can always start again. You can always try again. Lynn said earlier that we all make mistakes. We do. Learning, I mean, I'm, I'm five years in now and I'm still learning how to communicate with my children and be in relation with them. So I have to, you know, I go back. I go back all the time. Applying DBT skills is like playing tennis. Oh, this one works too, look. <laughs> you never know where the ball may go. Oh, there's a lot of balls. I tell you, there's a lot of balls juggling there. You must be ready with the DBT skill and respond quickly. Uh, also with this, I was thinking, you know, there's that old joke. A uh, woman gets in a taxi cab and says, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the response is, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> so that's how I feel about this. You have to develop a repertoire and practice, practice, practice. Uh, remember that your loved one is doing the best they can. This is someone you love. People with BPD can get better, and our help can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you to, to the three of you for a very interesting presentation, giving us a better understanding of what your very dynamic group is doing uh, in New York. Uh, merci beaucoup pour uh, cette présentation qui nous donne beaucoup d'idées sur comment le groupe de Tara for BBT travaille à New York. On, on est un peu en retard sur notre horaire. On va quand même prendre le temps pour quelques commentaires et questions. We are a bit late in our schedule, but we'll... Uh, take some comments or questions for uh, the group of uh, Tara. Uh, uh, yeah, the microphone is coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. A quick question about um, whether your training for your workshops is available by distance. Um, we're doing them in New York. We'll probably do one in California, and we're doing one in Portland, Oregon in um, April. But we do do some uh, webinars. They'll be coming up shortly. I'm traveling this whole month, so we won't do anything till November, December. And there are weekends. People come in from all over the country, and we had somebody from Australia once for a weekend workshop. Yeah, the next weekend workshop is December 4th, 5th, and 6th. In Unfortunately, it's in New York, but it's a nice place to visit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very much. Question or comments? And your group has been have been running for how many um, years? 15, 20 years, and we've trained thousands of people. We have outcome data on the changes that we make, and we do improve relationships. 
um, our total focus is on keeping the borderline person alive and safe. And so if you're unhappy and you're burdened, et cetera, you have a life. You have a job, you have relationships, you, you have a life. They don't. So our, our aim is always to help them. And it's very tough because they do a lot of very, very difficult things, abusive things, dangerous things. But we do make a difference. Any other questions? The book, we have the book for sale, by the way. Any other questions? Yes. How important is it that they acknowledge that they have? Um, Dr. Linehan, uh, when I first was trained by her many, many years ago, says that they should know that they have borderline personality disorder. Twenty years later, I have to say it really depends. Um, we've been trying for a long while with the American Psychiatric Association. How would you feel if somebody tells you something's wrong with your personality? Considering that shame is such a huge part of borderline, telling them that they have a bad personality is pretty tough. At the same time, there are some people who say, oh my goodness, you mean that's, it's an illness, other people have it, I'm not alone, this, so on. I don't know if there's no one answer. I do know that the first time I ever had a group, a, a BPD group, um, I showed them the neurobiology, a two-hour presentation on neurobiology, and the response was, you mean I'm not a bad person and my parents aren't bad. So on some levels, it's yes, tell them, but it's when and how and in what situation. You know, you have borderline, that's why you're acting like that. That's not gonna help you. I just wanna add to that, Valerie, that we have a young woman presenting with us later in the week who has borderline personality disorder. She's a beautiful young woman, she's in college, and she will, she, in her presentation, I'm sure she'll say it, I've heard her say it before, that she cannot interpret her boyfriend's face. And she looks at him and she thinks he's angry. And she has had to learn to check in with him. So her being aware of what the neurobiology of borderline is allows her to check in and say, well, I'm reading you as angry, are you angry? And to be able to check it out. So for her, it helps to know and to have some skills. I, I just, I just, there's one. Can you just repeat? Yes. Paul something, the compassion focused therapy. Oh, Paul Gilbert, compassion focused therapy. Gilbert. Yes. Yeah. And uh, they do some of it in the United States. I'm going to England for a second training in it. And um, Martin Bohas has been working with him. Um, it talks about the high threat protection system and then it talks about the safety system, the, the satisfaction system, which is dopamine, which doesn't work, work very well, and the affiliative system, which is oxytocin. So all those systems are off in people with borderline. So I think you had quite a bit of influence on you. Well, I came to that on my own, and then I found him. But he is the only treat. It's an evidence-based treatment. But his is the only treatment for borderline that addresses shame. It really goes into shame. So you can read his book, and um, a lot of the techniques I kind of invented, I, he also uses in compassion-focused therapy. We'll take one last question. Paul Gilbert, G-I-L-B-E-R-T. He also works with somebody named Russell Colts, K-O-L-T-S, and Russell Colts, um, has a fantastic book that doesn't talk about borderline called Managing Your Anger. You can actually get somebody with BPD to read it. And the other book that you should have your people with BPD read is um, I Thought It Was Just Me by Brene Brown, which is all about shame and perfectionism. So you gotta sneak it in on them. You don't, you don't give them borderline books, you give them books on some of the problems. Um, I don't know if you're addressing this later on in the day or if this is the right time to ask, but what happens if a BPD attacks his or her partner physically, throws things and says, I could kill you? <laughs> what um, would Tara say would be the proper <laughs> response to that? Well, what I'm going to say you're not going to like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the first thing is that if it gets to the level of throwing things and abuse and so on, it means, sorry, you missed the boat. 
it means there was something that happened and you missed it, you didn't hear it, and they escalated. You know, my colleagues here don't speak French, so if they want to go and buy something and the person only speaks French, each time they try to get to communicate, they're going to go up as the other person doesn't understand. At the time when they're getting to that level, all I could say is get out of Dodge, go away, get out of it. Try not to call the police because once you get involved with police and justice and departments, you're really in trouble. But you should watch for signs. You have to watch body language, voice tone. You could say, wow, it looks like you're really getting upset with me and I don't understand. But I, when you get this upset, I get frightened. So how about if I go and take a walk, have a cup of tea, and we come back in 20 minutes and start the conversation again. But don't sit there and let it get that high. There are warning signs. And that's why we keep saying, observe, observe, observe. And have a little courage. But you don't have to stand there and, and, and stay in with that. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Unfortunately, we'll have to stop now because of the tight schedule. So thank you very much to the Tara group for this very interesting presentation. The